Um, so welcome everyone to our Systems Neuroscience and Complexity Seminar. Um, this week, we're really, really lucky to have Mark Humphreys uh, joining us from the UK. Um, Mark probably won't uh, remember this at all, but back in 2016, I attended a Gordon conference for the basal ganglia uh, in Ventura, California, in this sort of dodgy old motel uh, off the side of a highway. Um, and I was a sort of fresh-faced young postdoc there, kind of listening to all these kind of amazing uh, world leaders in basal ganglia neuroscience, Ruby Costa and James Surmeyer and all these brilliant people. And I remember walking around one of the poster sessions and I was like, wow, what, what is that group of people doing? And there were like 20 people listening to someone speak at a poster session. I was like, oh, it's probably one of those, you know, optogenetic weenies from Stanford, you know, off, you know, manipulating D1, D2 or something. And it was actually Mark standing by one of the posters that wasn't his, giving an impromptu lecture to people about dynam uh, dynamical systems and dimensionality reduction. Um, and from, from that day forth, I've been a big fan, um, really enjoyed seeing all of your work and, and your uh, communication in science, particularly on Twitter. Really enjoy kind of watching along and, and sort of watching the sort of narrative of, of systems neuroscience as it's sort of rapidly evolving in front of our eyes. So I was really excited that you were happy to come chat to us and really keen to kind of hear what you've been thinking about with manifolds and dimensional reduction and, and uh, everything in that space. So take it away, Mark. Cool. Thank you, Mac. Um, all right, I hope I live up to that introduction. Um, so um, I'll see how, yeah. I remember, this, I remember the meeting, GRC Bears Ganglia meeting. Um, partly because I am finally getting around to working on the paper that was the subject of my talk at that meeting. So it's so, so slow is the life of a PI these days. Um, all right, cool. So I need to uh, share my screen, of course. So let me find my... Let's try that one. Right, slight delay. I want to let my Mac access my screen, having just updated to Big Sur, it's finally turned off everything. All right, so what I'll say is while we're in this longer, that um, I'll see, uh, sort of talking about um, um, our sort of interpretations of, okay. interpretations of uh, what, um, what it means when we do dimensionality reduction on neural activity. Uh, so it's a fairly philosophical talk, so it's pretty perfect for uh, for you guys. It's a Friday afternoon just before the pub. So let's try that again. All right, cool. So slides on, let's go, let's go slides live. Right, just check, can you see the actual slides rather than the presenter view? Yep, beautiful. Yeah, wicked, because normally Zoom Stories up my presenter view, which isn't very helpful. All right, great. So as I said, so we're going to get a fairly philosophical talk. Um, so just jump in uh, when you've got comments to share. In fact, the last time I gave this talk, I just stood back for a while while the audience debated some of the points, um, which is much more restful for me. So, okay, so let's motivate this. This um, Why do we care about dimension reduction in, for neural activity anyway? The only reason we care about that is because um, we got to the point where we can easily, well, I say easily, CERN labs around the world can routinely record the activity of thousands of simultaneous neurons. Um, here's an example of uh, activity where you've got a, a, a color, the colored in plot on the right hand side, that's a recording of about 3000 neurons simultaneously um, over the course of just under 400 seconds, uh, 300 seconds. And each of the rows is a neuron, and, each, and the color of that neuron is indicates how active it is. Now, this is a calcium imaging recording. So if you, we uh, zoom in that little red box on the bottom, you can see the individual traces of the individual neurons, 25 of them. And then you can see the peaks and troughs of the activity, in this case, the expression of calcium in the cell, which is a proxy for how electrically active it is. And on the top, they, the Dimes et al, who put out this preprint, have plotted where they've shown the mouse whose cortex this is being recorded from, um, either a visual stimuli or they flicked its whisker. And you can see when that's happening that there is a, a barrage of activity across a whole bunch of neurons. So we're recording many thousand neurons at the same time. And this recording is only gonna get more and more uh, dense as time goes on. Um, so this is a famous graph showing that the electrical recordings we can do in, in the brain, the recordings of the spikes, action potentials given out by neurons, 
uh, is going up exponentially fast with time. So on the uh, x-axis here you've got the publication date of key papers in electrophysiology in neuroscience and on the y-axis here you've got um, the number of simultaneously recorded neurons that they are reported in that paper and you'll notice the y-axis is a log scale so on this log scale in Stevenson when he's placing this data fitted a I'll see a uh, straight line and um, came up with a doubling time of about every 6.4 years was his latest estimate um, which means that at the moment we're around 2020 we are we've got a whole bunch of papers which are just over the thousand mark of thousand simultaneously recorded neurons in different parts of the brain um, and the individual spikes from each of those neurons, which means that in about 2026 some point we're expecting to have easily 2000 neurons recorded simultaneously, which is not, um, uh, which is not uh, implausible given that the new neural pixels 2 probe is about to come out and that has even higher density than the original neural pixels probe. And so each one of the probes should be able to, be able to record about 200 to 300 individual spike trains. You stick, um, you stick 10 of them in there, you've easily got 2,000. Okay. Um, but electrical recordings are uh, going up rapidly, but optical imaging is going up even more quickly. So in optical imaging, we are generally looking at calcium imaging, the example I gave at the start, where in this case, you're looking at the brain of a baby zebrafish, that see-through little tadpole-like thing on the, on the left-hand side. And in this example, you've got a calcium sensor genetically expressed in each of the neurons in the baby zebrafish's brain, about 100,000 neurons in there. And that calcium sensor is uh, a protein that fluoresces um, in proportion to the amount of calcium that's in the body of the cell. And the reason that's interesting is because the amount of calcium in the body of a neuron is quite a good proxy for how active that neuron is. The more spikes it sends, the more calcium will be in the, in the body. It's not a perfect relationship and it's quite slow, but it's a great way of looking at vast numbers of neurons at the same time. So that heat map you're looking at, um, that is a snapshot of calcium activity across the entire, uh, that plane of the entire zebrafish's brain, showing that they can pick up activity in this, from everywhere across the brain. And of course, optical imaging is so much, can pick up so many more neurons and electrical activity, uh, electrical recordings. So the scaling of that activity is going up even faster. Um, so the, uh, here is Anne Uri in, in and Churchill's lab, replotting you know, sort of in Stevenson's data in blue and adding more stuff and then plotting the current state of the art of optical imaging recordings in red. Again, the uh, y-axis is the number of simultaneously recorded neurons and here she's helpfully put on the rough numbers of neurons in various key species from C. elegans, nematode worm, 302 neurons, the zebrafish, baby zebrafish, about 100,000 neurons, mouse close to 100 million and us up there close to 100 billion, about 8, 7 billion. So what that's showing you then, of course, is the number of simultaneously recorded neurons we can get with optical imaging. It's got to the point where we can record, albeit very slowly, all the neurons in a, mean, in a meaningfully sized vertebrate brain, the zebrafish larvae. Um, obviously this is pretty slow, right? Typically this is, um, this is a, a frame rate of about two hertz or three hertz or something, it's two or three times a second, and quasi simultaneously because you're, you're scanning through various layers, not exactly at the same time. And the calcium dynamics themselves are much slower than spiking, but with all those caveats, we're still capturing something that's like the activity of each neuron and across the huge brain. To face with the scale of that activity, it is natural then that as a first step to understand what is going on, when you're faced with a hundred thousand time series of, of, of neural activity, um, and you're faced with those 100,000 in repeated situations, either you've recorded some recorded number of neurons over and over and over again, different sessions with the animal, you've recorded across multiple animals, or you even got them to do stuff through recording over trials, you have this extraordinarily vast array of um, activity to make sense of. In which case, people reflexively turn to dimension reduction, because obviously we want to make this, um, in this case, say, is ever fifth recording 100,000 dimension uh, data set much smaller. Well, see, this, this idea is now routine enough in neuroscience that we have, um, we have fairly standard uh, reviews that we go to, 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 or primers to look at to tell us how this is done. So this is two classic papers in 2014, one from Cunningham and U, and one from Adrian Fairhill's group, which is all about um, how dimension reduction can be done in neuroscience when it, uh, and, and some examples of it being done. So what this talk is about is really about um, what does it mean when we do dimensional reduction on these data? So I'm gonna um, 
spin through a uh, set of definitions, very abstract definition used here of dimension reduction, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Nothing technical, just a very simple uh, idea of what we're talking about. Then I'm going to outline the strong and weak principles of my title, um, which will then set the basis of the rest of the talk. So I'm going to talk about um, strong and weak principles being about the dimensionality of the activity, and then we'll talk about what can confound those strong and weak principles, what can make one look like the other. And because the strong principle is going to be the thing that is the most, obviously, as this, as this name implies, is the thing that is the most, um, uh, uh, also the strongest stance you can take on the relativity. So um, it's going to be the thing that we uh, uh, need to provide evidence for. Um, of course, when I, uh, I think I'm balancing myself here in my title here by showing that obviously I believe a little bit more on the strong principle and we'll talk about it more. There's no good talking about that without acknowledging lots of problems for it. And then um, what I end with was how we might proceed in systems neuroscience, given that this division between the weak and strong principles of how we interpret dimension and reduction uh, is useful. All right, so let's start with dimension reduction. So um, whenever we do dimension reduction on some neural activity, our starting point is always some matrix that looks like this. Right? So we have um, we have many columns as we have neurons. So for the baby observer fish, we have 100,000 columns. As many rows as we have time points at which we have captured the activity of that neuron. So um, each element then in the matrix is the activity of that neuron at that time point. Right? And the time points, of course, can be small or big. We'll come back to that later. Um, and each element then it depends on the type of recording you've got. So if it's an electrical recording, you may have your time points so fine that the uh, the element in the matrix is a zero or a one, just whether it's spiked or not. It could be the count of spikes, or if it's counter imaging, then the, el the element in that matrix is going to be some um, fluorescence level, which corresponds to the calcium, or it's going to be some transform that fluorescence level into some proxy of firing rate. So whatever it is, we have uh, a matrix which is um, n neurons across by um, t rows down. And all, pretty much all dimension reduction techniques are trying to do, and it's in the view we're taking here, is take away, reduce the number of neurons down to some smaller number of dimensions D, which is the common patterns of activity shared across the neurons. The patterns that make up as much of the variability of the activity of individual neurons as possible. So in a sort of activity view of the world, um, here is a rough, Hand drawn sketch of what that looks like. So on the left hand side in blue, we've got um, we've got five neurons in blue. They're their activity traces of time. So uh, each bump is an increasing rate of that neuron, right? Time across the bottom. And dimension reduction applied to those five neurons will note that there are those bumps of activity tend to align. So the most common patterns are those two in red. So here, dimension reduction applied to this group of five neurons would find these potentially these two common patterns, these two dimensions inside that five-dimensional space. Um, an equivalent view of dimension reduction, what that reduction to those patterns looks like, is that what we're finding is some, um, some lower dimensional space in which to describe the activity. So in this view of the world, we, if we think of just three neurons because it makes visualization much simpler. Three neurons um, in time, and let me bring up my laser pointer here. So three neurons in time, then uh, three neurons firing away. Each axis is the activity of an individual neuron. That point there is going to be the activity of those three neurons at a certain point in time. And then the next point in time, that's the activity of the three point neuron, three, those three neurons. Right? So that point there, say, is that neuron one is firing a little bit, so that far off the axis. Neuron three is firing a medium amount this far. And neuron two is firing maybe a lot, maybe it's this across this part of the axis. And then the activity changes again. So the next moment in time, that's the point that describes the, three, the activity of those three neurons and so on. So we think of the activity of the, these neurons is sitting in some high dimensional space where uh, it's tracing a trajectory in time and that the trajectory sits on some low dimensional space inside the high dimensional space. So for ease of visualization here, of course, we're saying that this low dimensional space is a plane. So we can redraw it here. And that just means that this activity is two-dimensional. We just need two dimensions to describe the activity. And this is exactly equivalent to this pattern view up here, because these patterns just are those low-dimensional trajectories 
when we project them down. Okay. So, also to be a little bit clear on what we're not talking about, um, all the, uh, although I'm thinking of this is about, we're thinking about dimensions of the activity in the brain in the moment to moment processing the brain does. So there's a huge number of really wonderful papers like these three um, about using dimension reduction to understand the brain on which their basis is dimensions of trial average activity, where they've taken the activity of, of um, each neuron, uh, which has been shown repeated stimuli or uh, over repeated movements. And it's the activity of each neuron has first been averaged over all the stimuli or the movements. So they give some kind of trial average activity for each neuron and then apply dimension reduction. So that's all about um, finding the common patterns of coding. Of course, that's not what the brain gets to see in the moment to moment. What we're interested in here is the dimensions of the activity that the brain actually gets to work with um, in real time, if you will. Right. Cool. So that's some quick definitions. Just make sure we're talking about the same page. Now, the key part is just some, my definitions of the strong and weak principles. So, so the weak principle is that um, dimensional reduction is just a tool. Uh, it's just something that we can take and apply to our data. And it's really useful when we do it, but it's nothing more than just a tool. Okay? So we might believe that for all sorts of reasons. One reason we might believe that, of course, is that we just, we know that whenever we record activity, um, uh, record activity over a, a, of an animal, we're recording it either over both, generally over a very short snapshot of time in which that brain is actually active. So, you know, we record for just a few hours out of a rat's entire life, for example. Um, and typically we give animals really low dimensional tasks to do, um, which means that we are, uh, uh, we're asking them to either move their arm in one of eight directions, we're asking them to press just two levers, we're showing them just a handful of really simple stimuli, or playing them with a handful of simple sounds. So those really low dimensional tasks, and it's not that short snapshot in time, might mean, of course, that um, the activity that we record is constrained to be low dimensional because of those factors, in which case, it's great to use dimension reduction, but that's not actually how the brain operates. The brain is really high dimensional in some way. Um, we're just, that happens that we're looking at it in a low dimensional state. Um, and of course, the other reason dimension reduction is a great tool is that it both allows us to denoise our data. So it will remove um, any variability that's unique to each individual neuron. So noise from recordings and so on. And of course, it's a great way of visualizing stuff that's really hard to wrap our heads around. But none of these things is it, none of these reasons for using dimension reduction is claim that the brain really operates in this low dimensional space. The strong principle then is the claim that the dimension reduction shows us the true signal embodied by a circuit. That the true thing the brain gets to work with is actually um, a signal that has many fewer dimensions than neurons. And that, um, in this case, this is when we think about coding, this is what we're talking about when various people talk about coding of latent variables, that there is hidden inside the activity of a large population of neurons, a thousand neurons, 10,000 neurons, whatever it is, that their joint activity encodes in latent variables, that is some uh, variable that only exists uh, being coded between uh, multiple, um, multiple neurons. Right, I can see this is an old version of my talk with some things that I'll skip through, right. So, let me make that a bit more concrete. Okay, so that's a bit abstract. So what do I mean by the strong principle is beautifully illustrated by this um, classic paper from um, Brigman and Abraham and Christian uh, from, screen says kicked in, there we go. Brigman, Abraham and Bill Christian from uh, 2005 in Science. So here, they're recording from um, the segmental ganglion of the leech. So on that left-hand side is a schematic diagram of the leech. Uh, aligned from his, from his head to his tail. And what they were doing was recording from one of their segmental ganglion, of which there, I think there are uh, 20, there are, eight, there are three numbered, there are eight, 13, and 15. There are 20 of these things. Um, and they were recording from one of them, this one here, this one they were recording from. Right? So they're recording using voltage imaging, they're recording about 140 to 250 neurons simultaneously, and the voltage of each at about 20 hertz. And while they're doing that, they were stimulating another ganglion down here. 
with electrical stimulation to the nerve that goes into it. And the reason they're doing that is because you stimulate this particular nerve, you get the animal when it's intact to either swim or crawl. Yeah. It can do either. And the way they, in this preparation, they worked out whether it was swimming or crawling was they, they then recorded the activity being sent to the muscles from a nerve coming out of another ganglion here. And that activity could either look like this, it might be strongly rhythmic bursting, in which case that would correspond to when the leech was swimming. So it's pushing away from the seabed in this sort of undulated wave motion. Or it would be the activities being sent to the muscles down this nerve was this rapid sequence of individual large spikes going down the axons, in which case that would be crawling. So it'd be crawling along the bed of the whatever it's sitting on. So they can read out what behavior the brain is initiating, um, and they can read out for one of those ganglion, which are basically identical, the activity that's potentially driving that behavior. What we can note here is that they've got two of their example recordings, 140 neurons each from the same, same recording, uh, an example of a swim trial and a crawl trial. And even by eye, as I note in the paper, you can see that the activity of the individual neurons is quite similar between whether it's swimming or crawling, despite the fact these are two quite different motor programs happening. So what they report in the paper is that you can't actually find individual neurons that strongly distinguish um, between uh, the um, strongly distinguish between the swimming and the crawling. And indeed, if you go in and blate individual neurons, you can find almost no, that seem to be strongly tuned to swimming or crawling, they have almost no effect whatsoever. So what they then said was okay well maybe what's this is the this is the population that definitely controls this maybe what we uh what is controlling this then is the joint activity of the whole population so let's project that activity down into a low dimensional space and see if we can tell the difference between the swimming and the crawling and that turned out to be extremely simple so here's the example they gave in the paper they projected down the swimming and the crawling trials from one animal into a three-dimensional space here. The activity starts here, where it's all clustered together. And then the mean trajectory, this mean so dimensional reduction of all these neurons down to its, this uh, high dimensional space, the common pattern of the swimming follows this mean, in, on average follows this thick blue line, the common pattern during crawling follows this red line. And what they show then was that very early on, you can very easily and strongly discriminate between whether the animal is about to crawl or about to swim by the divergence of the trajectories in this low dimensional space. And those individual thin lines are the individual trials that they've, they've averaged over. What they particularly um, were happy to see was this thing in green. And this thing in green is a single trial where at the start of the trial, when they monitored the nerves activity that's going to the muscle, the nerves activity looked like it was uh, a crawl, so it started with the burst and started with some individual neurons, and then it switched to bursting as though it was swimming. And when they looked at the population activity, you could see that it changed its mind. So it started swimming. So it started swimming, bursting. And then about here, um, it then switched over to the trajectory for crawling. So the animal's population activity in this ganglion switched from one motor program to the other, and that drove the activity. So the schematic here on the right is really, they drew in the paper, is really sort of a, um, a good example of the thing I'm talking about. It's the idea that uh, in here in the brain leech, the thing that's encoding the motor program of the animal is not any individual neural activity. It is some low dimensional signal contained within the low dimensional activity. And that low dimensional signal goes in one trajectory to generate crawling and another trajectory to generate swimming. So the same neurons in the same region it's just the trajectories they create of their joint activity, low dimensional space, is the thing that's encoding what's going on. Right. Okay. So that's an outline of the strong reap principles and an example of what that, what that means. So what I'm going to talk about briefly now is um, a question of uh, why we can't just apply dimension reduction naively and just go, um, okay, so we've applied dimension reduction, we found this many dimensions, therefore it must be low dimensional and strong principle is true, or we found lots of high dimensions, therefore it's uh, lots of dimensions, therefore the high dimensions in the data, therefore the weak principle is true. Um, so, so naively we think we can just do this. We could just take, as we did in this, this paper back in 2015, take 30 recordings here, 30 recordings here from the motor system of a sea slug, 
which I'll introduce you more detail later. Each of those recordings is uh, just over 100 neurons. So you can see on the x-axis here, we're plotting the number of embedding dimensions that we need, but the maximum being the number of neurons in the data. And this is a simple PCA. So this is just the number of dimensions that we need to reconstruct the variance of the activity. Um, and in all these 30 recordings, to, to, we needed just at most 10 dimensions to reconstruct 80% of the variance between these 100 or so neurons. So a dimension reduction by a factor of at least 10. So it seems what we could do is obviously we can just do dimension reduction, just count number of dimensions we need to explain how much variance or whatever preferred metric we have, and to say, oh, it's low, high dimensional. Um, the problem with that view is, is that there is a confound of uh, many confounds, one of which I'll talk you through here, and there's a whole bunch more um, in the paper I'll flag at the end if you're interested. So the almost obvious confound is the question of time scale. Right? We can play with the time scale which we represent the data and make the data lower high dimensional to make it um, adhere to whichever principle that we prefer, the weak principle that's just at all, the strong principle that it really is low dimensional signal, okay? Um, so that, that confound is that um, if we, if that is about the time scale, is that it's about how big we choose that, uh, this time step to be, this size of this row in time is what's gonna set the confound of the time scale. So if we make that um, if we make that time step really really short, then uh, it becomes increasingly unlikely that individual neurons are going to be um, correlated with one another. Um, and because of that, that means that obviously when we try and then do dimension reduction and we try and find some kind of shared activity between the neurons, of course we're going to find less and less of it, so it's going to estimate dimension is going to be higher. But the longer we make the time step, the more likely it is that neurons are going to have some shared activity with each other in a given um, uh, point in time and the lower the dimensionality is going to be. And we'll see that's a great thought experiment. We can just prove that it's true um, by taking some data. So here again from the C slug, we'll take an example recording of about 100 neurons. Uh, and what we've not done here is just plot out a simple PCA, uh, the number of dimensions that we um, use to reconstruct the original data and the variance explained on the y-axis here for different time scales. So um, here, the dark blue curve is the smallest time beam we use, and the light blue one at the top is the longest time beam that we use. Right? As you can see, then the variance explained curve uh, gets steeper and steeper and steeper. The, um, the bigger and bigger and bigger that we make the time step that we use. And if we plot that out slightly more human readably, um, like this, then what we plotted here is in blue is the number of dimensions we need to explain 80% of the variance, which is this line here, right, across each of these curves. Right? So you take the one of the highest time scale, which is back here, about 100 milliseconds bins, we need about 45 dimensions. We take the most extreme, biggest time scale here, about one second bins, we need just five dimensions. Right? And the same, we can take 90% variance up here instead. Okay. So that means that for this particular recording, which has 100 neurons, if we chose a small time scale and needs, it will need basically half as many dimensions as there are neurons to reconstruct the activity, which suggests that it's really, really high dimensional signal. If though we take um, a one second time step, we just need five neurons. So a factor of 20 reduction, which looks like a high, uh, low dimensional um, signal. So simply measuring dimensionality doesn't get us very far in considering whether or not um, a given brain region or a good circuit population of activity really is something that adheres to the strong principle or whether the weak principle is true when we apply dimension reduction to it. Okay. So um, it's worth then considering lots of kinds of evidence for the strong principle that are not coming directly from dimension reduction. There's two reasons for doing that. So one is that of course that um, as I've just shown you and there are many more of these there are very various confounds that will can go for uh, go into dimension reduction that can um, tell us whether uh, that can, we can um, tune whether we believe that activity is high or low dimensional depending on our uh, analysis choices and the way that we approach the data. So the other reason for continuing evidence for the strong principle is that really it's as it says the strong approach. Right? Um, the weak principle is something of a default position. It's better to just assume it's a tool, assuming that the steps take that dimension reduction are showing us 
that how the brain actually works um, is quite a strong statement. So it's good to consider then a whole bunch of evidence um, that uh, is points to the fact the strong principle is true. That is not directly about the number of dimensions in the data. So, um, so briefly run through four little snippets of evidence, each individually perhaps weak, but in the spirit of consilience, which is how science generally works, which is we generally come to believe stuff by uh, converging evidence from a whole bunch of weak, individually weak uh, bits of evidence. Um, that's what we're looking at here. Okay, so the first, um, first thing is simply that neurons seem to be correlated and they're correlated everywhere that we look at them. So a lovely example of this is from um, some fantastic work, very old now, from uh, Elad Schneinman and uh, Bill Bialek's team uh, from 2006. And here is this classic study where they were recording from the retina of a salamander. So that's a picture of the top supposed to be a salamander. Can't see its eyes. The salamander. Recording from the retina of a salamander. They're recording about 40 neurons simultaneously from the, ret the retinal ganglion cells of the salamander. So the retinal ganglion cells are the cells in the retina that are sending the spikes to the rest of the brain to send them on for visual processing through the visual thalamus and visual cortex. And recording those 40 cells while the salamander was being shown natural movies. So just films they'd recorded themselves outside in various natural environments. And what they're interested in is the structure of the population activity while it was looking at these natural movies. So what they did in their first step in their analysis was just to take time. So here they've taken 10 of those neurons and it's taken time divided up into these really small 20 millisecond bins. Each green line is giving a bin. And then they're just going to count uh, when each neuron spikes in that bin and call that a binary pattern. So here in that first bin, there's no spikes at all. So the binary pattern is all zeros. In that second bin, neuron labeled 11 spikes. So we have a one in its position here. And then, for example, a more complicated one, there are two neurons spiking next to the two neurons adjacent to each other, an index number of spiking here in that bin. So that binary word has all zeros and two ones at the end. So what they're interested in here was the correlation structure and how much information this carries. And um, what they're able to show is if they simply count the number of patterns, which has a certain number of uh, spikes in it. So obviously this 000 has zero spikes in it, 0010 has one spike in it and so on. And they count that and plot the distribution of them. Then what they found in red here is that the number of spiking cells in a 20 millisecond window follows this red distribution up here. Probability on here, uh, obviously is a log access again. Um, and as a control, then they plotted out how many uh, spiking cells you'd expect to see in a 20 millisecond window um, if the neurons were not correlated at all, so these independent cells. And that's the blue line here. And so this is done by simple shuffling control. There's other ways of doing this, of course. So the independence, the probability of finding a number of spiking cells in a small, this small time window has fallen so rapidly that in fact, when we get to about 10 spiking cells put in a, in a 20 millisecond window, the probability of observing that is 10 to the minus three in data, so not negligible. But the probability of it finding any independent cells is essentially zero. So the difference is almost infinite in probability between the data and the independent cells. So um, what these, what their main initial main claim in this paper was, was that obviously that um, even though these individual neurons, we look at pairwise correlations between them are fairly weak, right? The average like, correlation coefficient between over time between the pair of them was um, uh, something like 0.05 or something. Uh, the population structure is highly structured. Right? And Anytime we see a highly correlated structure between population of neurons, we know that there must be some low dimensional thing happening because the dimension reduction applied to this will find that structure if we choose the right dimension reduction approach and give us a low dimensional view of the world. So everywhere we see correlations in the brain and we see them everywhere, we know there has to be fewer dimensions representing stuff than there are neurons. Right? So a stronger version of that statement is um, what happens when we go and deliberately look for groups of neurons that are consistently correlated in time. So this classic idea of neural ensemble. So neural ensemble being a group of neurons whose 
activity is more than just pairwise correlated, it's correlated amongst pretty much all the pairs in that group. And if we can find well isolated neural ensembles, then that's strong evidence that the brain has some kind of low dimensional structure in its activity, at least in that brain region. So to illustrate this idea, I'm going to take you back to some of our old work. Um, so I think I mentioned a couple times already is a uh, uh, work we did on the motor system of the sea slug aplysia, and this isn't aplysia here. Um, aplysia are gigantic, I discovered. So they're working with Bill Frost, lab in Chicago and his grad student, Angela Bruno, who did the recordings about the sea. So I wanted to see, see their lab and although I've been shown lots of videos and appreciate that aplysia are about a foot long. So these things are gigantic, um, but really simple. They only have about 18,000 neurons in their brains. And what we were studying them in is in their, um, their panic mode. They were, um, they were being stimulated to gallop in their escape response. And Angela sent me this lovely video of their escape response so you can see this rhythmic behavior that we're about to analyze. Let's see if it's uh, gonna play for you. There we go. So this is the absolute top speed of a sea slug. So it stretches its neck out, plants it, arches its back and hauls its ass along behind it. And does this over and over again, often up to 15 minutes. And we can elicit this by simply pinching its tail or stimulating the tail nerve. Of course, as you can see, this is in real time. So whatever it's running away from, it's not very scary, nor is it moving very fast, because this is the absolute top speed of a sea slug. Now that's a really stereotyped behavior, and we can make the sea slug's brain do that by stimulating its tail nerve, which means that when we, we can take its brain out of its body, of course, we can stimulate that tail nerve and make it do the galloping activity uh, while recording um, lots of its neurons. So here, uh, we're recording, um, this, is the, this thing over here is the, I think called the pedal ganglion. This is the cell of neurons that control, contains the central pattern generator and all the other neurons that are involved in this, this galloping behavior. Stimulate the tail nerve and you elicit this galloping behavior and you get this activity in here. And this is a snapshot here of that activity recorded in here about uh, 80 neurons recorded simultaneously from that structure, uh, about a minute snapshot of that activity. And each row is neuron, each dot is a spike. So we're looking at um, individual spike resolution activity from what is about 10% of the neurons in this system, so pretty dense uh, sampling. And you can see by eye um, that a lot of the neurons have quite similar patterns of activity, right? which would suggest there are some, there are some genuine ensembles here. There are generally groups of neurons that have, are very strongly correlated in time because they have a similar patterns of activity. So quite first question for us in this paper was, let's go and find the ensembles and then we can find out what they're doing, where they are, and that kind of thing. So this is, of course, an unstructured um, clustering problem. So uh, I'll skip all the gory details, but the idea is basically is we take that pattern of those, that group of activity, uh, that recording of 80 neurons in this case, and we developed a um, unsupervised clustering algorithm for spike train patterns, which is based on ideas of network theory. Um, and the general idea is that we represent the neural activity as a graph so we have each node is a neuron and the link between a pair of nodes is the strength of the correlation between them and then we um, develop uh, algorithms that can um, cluster that graph into groups of nodes that are more strongly linked together than they are to any other node so this is the problem of community detection if you know your network theory and a particular version of this which is highly robust and finds the consensus across multiple runs of these kind of algorithms and for this particular set of data, that graph I'm showing you there is the answer the algorithm spits out. So each little different colored group is a group of nodes, group of neurons that the algorithm says are more correlated with each other than they are with all the other neurons. And um, a simple thing we can then do is we can then take that set of colored in nodes, right? And we can replot that raster plot on the left, take exactly the same neurons and just replot it in the color order on the right, which is what I'm going to show you now. So that plot there is just that set of neurons on the left, but reordered according to the algorithms clustering. And then the structure is really, really obvious. We can see, for example, this light blue group here, which is my favorite one I always talk about in talks, um, has some really strongly structured activity created across all neurons over the entire recording. So they all burst together and they all send single spikes together. So this is a really strongly correlated group of neurons. Similarly, uh, without burst structure, this, this dark blue group down here um, 
are also strongly correlated in time down to the individual spikes occurring like this time here, uh, strongly correlated in time. So when we find such um, beautifully strong ensemble structure with so clearly isolated ensembles, we can show this group of neurons genuinely is strongly correlated. Then we know that this region of the brain must be operating in fairly low dimensional space because we can replace each of those ensembles with a single, essentially a single variable which stands for its activity. So here with uh, 14 ensembles, which is a, something perhaps an overestimate because it's very finely grained division of this phasic activity up here, we know that this is a, the must collapse in dimensions um, compared to the original number of neurons, okay? All right. Can I ask a question there, Mark? Yeah, sure, go ahead. The, the wave that the, uh, that the little slug uses to escape, is that mm. similar or, or different to the kind of waves you'd see with peristalsis in the gut? I was sort of just trying to think a bit of Eve Marta's work and thinking about this kind of really interesting low dimensional patterns that emerge from those little circuits and whether or not you could think of this as a kind of more elaborate version of that that's you know a bit more uh, specific to that the this particular you know set of effectors in the slugs musculature I, I was just curious whether there were links there yeah I think I think that's that's quite a good analogy actually um so certainly, as I, as I noticed, so in that pedal ganglion thing, we know the central pattern generator is in there because we can isolate that section of the brain and it can still escape to the galloping mm -hmm. thing. Um, so as you say, in Eve Marder's work, they've got the central pattern generator for the pyloric and gastric rhythms of the lobster's uh, digestive system or the carabs mm. digestive system. Um, it's just that that system is much smaller. So it's, yes. uh, what, yes. it's like 20 odd neurons that are in four classes or something. Yeah. Um, Whereas here, the pedal ganglion is about um, 1,600, 1,800 neurons. And there is no obvious sort of identifiable, a few neurons are the central pattern generator. Indeed, one of the main points of this paper was to show that it really looks like it's a whole chunk of the network is the central pattern generator. Mm -hmm. It's much more distributed thing. Nonetheless, yes, um, it is a whole bunch of neurons in there that are, are in, obviously generating a whole different collections of rhythmic movement, rhythmic activity to drive different aspects of that rhythmic behavior. So indeed, we think that the, all the neurons on the top of this, this plot here, uh, those are the central pattern generator. They all happen to be in the same location in the network. Um, and then others are in different locations and perhaps driving different aspects. So for example, um, obviously the whole thing where it, it reaches forward and it plants its neck and it holds itself along, that's a nice big rhythmic movement. But there's a whole sort of, obviously there's contractions of the body wall happening as well and mm -hmm. fine movements of the neck muscles that are probably controlled by some of the uh, less obviously strongly phasic um, activity. And also we know in here that some of these neurons are ones almost certainly that release serotonin into the system and they're probably the ones that aren't firing phasically. Um, they sustain the movement. Um, but yeah, so on a, on a really blown up scale, yes, there is quite a lot of similarity to the, to the Eve Marner stuff. Yeah, awesome. One one more um, slightly yeah. odder follow up question with this: Do you know if there are ways that that the um, slug can have its little tail neurons stimulated that don't cause it to flee? Because you could imagine that if there was something touching its um, tail that wasn't aversive or wasn't perhaps potentially reflecting, you know, the presence of a predator or something like that, even though it couldn't escape, even if it tried, um, that you might want to use that information in in a different context, right? In, in Eve Marta's case if the central pattern generator gets stimulated, now it's time to digest. And if it doesn't, now it's not time to digest. It's a much, it's a very simple switch of whether or not the system should be kicked into gear or not. Whereas if the tail neuro neuron gets stimulated, now there's all these different contexts. If it's in the context of safety and lots of food around and you're really hungry, you might want to stick around and eat. Or if it's in the context of, I just smelled a predator and you know I've had plenty of food already, now it's time to get on your horse and, and get out of there. I'm just really curious, you know, if there's any sort of sensitivity there to context. So, yeah, um, I, it's a good question. So we're not quite sure. So the, um, there hasn't been an awful lot of uh, sort of behavioral studies, at least published behavioral studies of this, of, this, of the plesia. Uh, just in toddlers this, in the back garden. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of labs who just um, uh, set students to do a lot of work on these things. Um, and they maybe write the stuff up in their thesis or just observe some stuff. And it's just like, I find a lot of the work, the sort of knowledge in the vertebrate community is just sloshing around in the ether as opposed to being written mm. down. Interesting. Um, so the, uh, so yeah, so I, I, 
obviously in this in the, in the preparation we're looking at obviously the tail nerve is directly stimulated as though it had an aversive you know yes. stimulus so yes. it's, it's always been it's going so yes it takes as i understand it strikes it takes a strong mechanical pinch to the tail to make it gallop if you just touch it or stroke it i think it's it's not going to be a boat um okay cool and what we do know is that the the program is easily interruptible so um if you're galloping away if something touches the tentacles it will pause the galloping and it will sort of explore briefly and then resume the the gallop um so it's it yes i i would wager yes it's likely that it's context dependent to some degree and it certainly isn't an all or none constant event it can be it can be uh interrupted because see there are command neurons up in the um cerebral ganglion of the animal which are uh, playing a large role in whether or not it's, it's the, the activity starts um so there is certainly the brain wiring there for contextual um uh, sort of processing cool yeah thank you cool um let's notice i've been rambling quite a lot so i'm gonna speed up a little bit so we can get some more questions in right um one of the sports the strong principle is that uh if we claim that there's a low dimensional signal in the brain then um we ought to be able to do some de decode stuff from that low dimensional signal which is what i'm going to show you now so again, this, we're talking about these C-slug recordings. It's the same recording I've just shown you. And in this um, second paper, what we did was took a, take the low-dimensional view of the world explicitly. So we uh, projected these recordings during the scallop into a low-dimensional space. And here's an example of three of them. So again, it's a three-dimensional space. The activity starts around these gray dots here. When we stimulate that tail nerve, it shoots up over here. And then it forms this spiral. There are three recordings from the same animal here, which is why it overlaps a bit. They all form this spiral, which goes down in time over here. So in time goes from blue through purple to red towards the end. And that loop of activity gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So we can describe this activity of this ganglion across this 150, in this case, often 200 neurons that were recorded from um, quite well in, as a spiral in about three to six dimensions. And while this is recording was happening, we like the Brigman example in the leech I showed you earlier, Angela was recording from a key uh, nerve that projects out to the neck muscles, which is that bit which gets planted on the base of the, uh, of the tank and pulls the animal along. And you can see that after the stimulus kicks in about here, and then that's when you get this bursting activity, which is presumably the, like the contraction of the neck muscle uh, rhythmically happening. The question we just want to ask here is, can we decode the activity of the neck muscle from this lower dimensional activity directly to show that the low dimensional trajectory actually encodes the motor program? So the answer was, of course, yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you. Um, and here's an example where the trace in black is that um, motor neuron activity from the neck uh, projecting nerve. Uh, that gray bar there is when the stimulus was on. And obviously, it's, it's really rhythmic. The colors then are in blue is the training fit where we take this low dimensional signal in, in this case, into four dimensions and we uh, predict the activity. And then we take that model that we've trained and then we let it run forward in time without any more training data to forecast the rest of the data and it forecasts it pretty damn well. Um, so yeah, in this example, admittedly a simple example, uh, was this a test that we can really genuinely encode something that's happening in the brain. In this case, the activity going to the neck muscle from the low dimensional trajectory. Um, there. So I'm going to skip over this part because it takes a little while to explain and think about problems. So um, strong principles really, for me at least, is really um, alluring this idea that the various parts of the brain operate entirely in low dimensional space, um, partly because I work a lot on motor systems and most systems seem to be low dimensional. But there are three things that the strong principle has real problems with. One is a genuine reason why we might believe regions of the brain are high dimensional. And the other two is that there are facts about the brain which are entirely um, opaque to the strong principles. So why do these things exist if the strong principle is true? Yeah. So, so there's various parts of the brain in which we um, expect that there will be um, really high dimensional coding, or high dimensional activity. And that's partly particularly true in sensory regions where we expect there to be things like sparse coding. So, um, here, what you're looking at is a whole tile of receptive fields of different neurons in visual cortex, at least a synthetic example of. And each tile is a single neuron, and the little um, sort of black and white sections correspond to the bits where it is excited by the presence or absence of light. Right? 
So most of these are looking at edges. So this example here has just one white bar, and one black bar. So that then defines an edge at that particular angle, the, 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 uh, the alignment of the white and the black. Right? And so as you can see, this is a whole then menagerie of, of detectors for various edges of various complexity, the narrow ones and thick ones and blurry ones, the ones at different angles and orientations, uh, ones of different complexity. So there's some here which have got multiple features, so they will find multiple textures more than simple edges and so on. And you can imagine this then blown up to uh, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these that which tile the entire space of possible ways you would represent an edge simply, different orientations, different thicknesses and so on. So that's how we think, you know, early visual cortex is encoding the world, particularly in V1. Then if you take a particular, LC, and there will be these looking at uh, individual pixels in space. But if you take a particular picture, this apparently this lovely lady is called Jenny, according to the JPEG. Um, and we have all these neurons looking at just this region of the world at the front of teeth. Then because teeth only have a certain set of edges and a certain set of orientations, um, then of that group of neurons here, we expect only that set to be active. Right? When they're looking at that particular world, part of the world. And the world moves frequently, so we'd expect the activity to change the set of neurons that are active to change every time the world changes. Um, so this is the idea that there is both population sparseness, the idea that in any given population of, of sensory coding neurons, only a tiny fraction of them will be active at any one time because only those elements they respond to are available in the world. And for most neurons, in sensory stuff, the stuff they respond to is not in the world at the moment. And then lifetime sparseness in that each neuron has a very specific thing it's tuned to, and that doesn't turn up very often. So it won't be firing very much. So both those factors, I think, combined to create sparse coding, which means that we expect that um, both over time and over neurons, there will be very little simultaneous activity consistently of any given neurons. So in that case, we expect there to be really high dimensional coding in visual systems, which is obviously strongly, which we see some evidence of and strongly contradicts the strong principle. So right through the last two. The strong principle is about low dimensional activity. And the problem with that is that it has no explanation then for why these things exist. The next explanation for why there are then so many, a crazy number, as well as we can tell, of different cell types in the brain. So here, for example, is a recent um, survey uh, of using transcriptomics of the genetic types of neurons inside the mouse cortex. And this is from the motor region called ALM in the mouse cortex. And you've got the classic divisions of cells in here. This is the intratelencephalic neurons, the pyramidal tract neurons, non pyramidal neurons, called scopholamic, and the mysterious L6B neurons. And the transcriptomics says that across those classic sets, there are about 30 different types of neurons in that brain region alone. And this paper, they report uh, there are, in fact, about 54 different glutamatergic types of neurons in cortex. So, which, from the point of view of the brain causing uh, low dimensions, makes no sense whatsoever. You don't need a, lot, a huge variety of a zoo of cell, cell times in order to code things in low dimensions. In fact, you can do that in a recurrent neural network with just two types of neurons, an excitatory one and an inhibitory one. You don't need this menagerie. So the strong principle, this is a, a real mystery as to why the brain contains many cell types. Another deep mystery for, uh, if you believe in the strong principle, is why individual neurons are, are capable of such powerful computation. So here's a lovely example. This is a review from Mickey London and Michael Hauser. So you're looking at a pyramidal cell here in black. That's its apical dendrite up here, the cell body here, the basal dendrite down here. And what they're showing is across that genetic tree is the various kinds of computation that an individual neuron's dendrites can do. And they can do very many. For example, just its passive cable properties means that it acts as a low pass filter for its inputs. And for example, the ordering of synapses and whether inhibitory or excitatory in local parts of the, the dendritic tree can implement logic operations. And there are some great papers, both old and new, now showing how a single dendritic tree of a, of a pyramidal cell um, is really something that looks that can only really be captured by a multi layer neural network which implies that an individual neuron has this massive computational capacity. Which, of course, if we believe that the brain operates as a low, using low dimensional signals spread across thousands of neurons, is entirely, is entirely bizarre. Because why would you need your individual neuron to, in, to have all this computational capacity if the brain actually works in just in the cell of lower dimensions? 
Right. So let me wrap up quickly so we've got time for a few questions before I have to run. So where to proceed? So the idea then is to me that the strong and weak principles are both a way of thinking about what we're doing when we do dimension reduction about what it means. And then of course, layers out something of a research program. So it says, so one of your research program is it the strong principle true? So things like do single neurons matter at all, both in their computation and their representations? And there's a question of then, if it is true, then a, a deep question would be what kind of dynamical system does a neural circuit implement in order to generate these low dimensional trajectories activity that we see? Um, another point of view, if we think about this as a research program, is all the problems I just outlined for the strong principle are actually questions to attack in that research program, right? About where there is and is not high dimensional activity, why there is cell type diversity, why there's tragedic computation, if the brain encodes in low dimensions. And then the final thing is that perhaps as a research program, we might fervently hope that the strongest version of the strong principle is true. So, for example, say I was able to um, blithely assert that uh, across a whole macaque motor cortex, we could reduce um, the dimensions of activity by a factor of 100, right? So we need only 1% of all of the number of the neurons to, to encapsulate all the activity the whole of macaque motor cortex does. That would mean that if you just take the primary motor cortex of macaque, that has 50 million neurons in it. So even if it was a factor of 100, we would still have half a million dimensions to work with, which as outlined at the start, the whole point of dimension reduction is to give us something we can, we can cope with and think about. So half a million dimensions is not um, a great advance on 50 million. What we perhaps really hope is that it's like this sketch I've drawn in this bottom right hand corner here, is that as we increase the number of neurons we're getting from our we're sampling on our circuit, the number of dimensions we need to understand them plateaus very quickly. It plateaus after a few thousand and is a fraction of that few thousand and then doesn't grow any bigger. That way that's genuinely low dimensional. So you know dimension reduction in the orders of factors of thousands or tens of thousands. And that leaves then one head scratching thought, right? Is that if we can genuinely take a brain region which has got 50 million neurons in it and perfectly understand it and it operates, we think, in, uh, in just handfuls, a hundred, a thousand dimensions, then why does it have all those neurons in the first place? Right, so uh, with that thought, I shall um, end by giving my thanks to members of my team, past and present, on whose projects we've worked in various ways that have informed these thoughts. Uh, Merkel Research Council for funding and my collaborators, Adrian Parash on prefrontal cortex work, I think a chance to talk about and Angela Bruno and Bill Frost for that sea slug stuff. And I'll leave you with the fact that if you want to read about this in slightly more clarity and much more detail on each of these points, then uh, the paper just came out in the lovely Neurons Behavior Data Analysis and Theory Journal, which is neuroscience's first overlay journal for archive. So it's completely free to publish in. Okay, thank you very much, everybody.